He was the life of the party. Always loved a good time, quick for the joke. We've just passed the anniversary of the first recorded death of COVID-19 in Massachusetts. Since then, the confirmed death toll has risen past 16,500 in the state. She was just the sweetest, kindest soul. Each one in that number was a life, and each left behind friends, families, and loved ones to grieve. He was just so sociable, uh, and he was just so full of, uh, of life. She always had this amazing presence about her that no matter what was wrong, she always made it okay. These people are among those who've had to cope with losing a loved one in an entirely different world. The pandemic has been so hard for so many, but the people who suffered losses this last year often had to do it in isolation. And those who spoke to me for this video said it has been incredibly challenging. Constant goodbyes missed and others that just came through a computer screen almost not seeming real. Then constant reminders of what COVID took away every day but also people working through grief and therapy while still waiting for closure. And for those who work to help individuals coping with death, they've seen a change in grief itself when the world is less certain. The assumptive world refers to the way in which we orient our lives, the way in which we find security and understanding in our society and in our culture. And with the pandemic, there's a loss of that assumptive world. The COVID deaths are tend to be harder on people because there's that element of trauma. There's an element of ambiguity. The coronavirus can move fast and the fear of infection meant that many people couldn't say their final goodbyes to loved ones who'd become sick. Roy told me that's usually a very important part of the grieving process for many people. A lot of those moments where individuals are able to be together during the passing, there's you know, saying, I love you, saying, I forgive you, asking for forgiveness, going through unfinished business. Elizabeth Feinstein from Marblehead, Massachusetts, lost her father to COVID-19 in April of last year. He was like very like serious, responsible person, but he had a great sense of humor. And he just had this like infectious smile that you couldn't help but really smile back. Her father was in the hospital in New York and seemed to recover and was sent home. But three days later, he was back in the ER and the nurse told her to come right away. But by the time she drove from Massachusetts to New York, it was too late. So I didn't make it by about 10 minutes. Um, so that was, that was tough, but I knew that was, that was a possibility. Uh, but I still got to see him. The resident went in with me. And uh, even though he didn't have family by his side, when he died, I knew that she was there. If I'm near a hospital or ambulance sirens, it still definitely triggers the memories of that day. Vanessa Hinchliff from Plymouth, Massachusetts, lost her grandmother towards the start of the pandemic last year, a woman who helped raise her and was a major figure in her life. She always made everybody around her laugh. She was always laughing. Everything was always funny. Her laugh, when you heard it, you it just made you all bubbly and happy inside. <laughs> she was in a nursing home and she had started getting sick and the nursing home just automatically assumed, well, it's COVID. So they put her on the COVID floor. When the test came back negative, they brought her back to her room and quarantined her in her room. And then she started to go seriously downhill. Um, and get very, very sick. They ran another COVID test and she, it was positive. It's more than likely that she picked up COVID when she was put on the COVID floor. The last time she saw her grandmother, they were having Jamaican food and sharing stories. She remembers thinking about how excited she was to do it again. But the next time she saw her grandmother, she was being taken away by an ambulance. And I saw them put her into the ambulance and drive off. And that was the last time I saw her in person. So I had the chance to like wave to her from afar. And I told her, I'll see you soon. Hospital visitors have been limited in how they can interact with patients over the past year. Many have had to resort to saying goodbye through a screen, making the loss feel less real. This is what I'm hearing from people. And that ambiguity is when there's not a clear 
um, understanding of the death. Their loved one went into the hospital and never came out. And then because of the COVID restrictions, they weren't able to go in and be at the bedside to share in that decline in passing experience. And that suspension from reality makes it hard to let go. Probably very unhealthy, but I still haven't even deleted her phone number from my phone. And I still go to pick up the phone sometimes and think of something and I'm like, oh, I wanna go call my grandmother. And I'm like, wait a second, she's not gonna answer. Elizabeth Roundtree lost her mother to COVID-19 in May last year, just 10 months after losing her father. She was a big lover of animals. She was one of those people that cried at that Sarah McLaughlin ASPCA commercial. She's very, very sweet, kind, gentle person. She died on uh, Mother's Day at two o'clock in the morning. The biggest challenge is coming to a place of acceptance because how can it be real? It, it was on a screen. I wasn't there. You know, you're not making these decisions face to face with a medical team. It's all done on a screen. It's horrible. It's horrible. You know, especially to lose someone like your mom and you can't be there to hold her hand, you know, and to comfort her. And yeah, it's very difficult and it really keeps you, it holds you back from processing that this is something that really happened. She really died. When Roundtree's father died, they were able to give him a funeral with full military honors. But the pandemic has made it difficult to give her mother the same. It's so different from the way my dad passed away. You know, he had a beautiful military honors funeral. We were so proud of the ceremony that we had for him and we knew he would have loved it. So not only do you feel like you kind of let this person down by not being with them when they were dying, but also you feel like you've let them down because you didn't give them this ceremony that they deserved. Sarah Gillis from Worcester, Massachusetts, lost her father to COVID-19 in December. The, the one thing about my dad was that he was always sick. He had really bad asthma. Um, he was in the high risk group. Because his asthma was so bad, he knew. He would tell everyone, I'm a dead man if I catch this. He had tried so hard to stay safe, but he had to work, as we all do in some regard and he caught it. Since she's high risk medically, she had to experience her father's final weeks remotely and mourn his death from two states away through a computer. That was a voice on a laptop in the receiving line. It was the oddest experience of my life. Um, my sister did the same. So we were one little monitor with two sisters on it um, and his girlfriend was there and they, they streamed it for about an hour. It was definitely lacking. There was definitely a disconnect, you know, being a talking voice in a box, people just saying how sorry they are. It's weird, very weird. Mariah well, said that these lost goodbyes and other tragic circumstances have brought about new forms of guilt. I have had several individuals that I've talked with where their loved one died from COVID while they also were suffering from the, the virus themselves. It's not even like they were able to say goodbye because they themselves were fighting the virus. I've had, uh, have counseled with people where the younger generation passed away, but the older generation was able to fight the coronavirus. So it's, it's a flip in the hierarchy that you wouldn't see that often, I don't know, is addressed in the news because there's a lot more emphasis on certain age groups. We talk a lot about um, the guilt that we feel. Um, you know, did we make all the right decisions? Not as much now, but in the beginning, it was constantly, it was constantly replaying in my head that why did I stop, you know, at a rest area in Connecticut? Maybe I would have made it. I unfortunately carry a lot of guilt. Um, that's kind of actually one of the most lingering emotions I feel. I wish my grandmother could get a vaccine. <laughs> and if things hadn't turned out the way they had, and the mistakes hadn't been made, I, that's kind of a hard part, hard pill for me to swallow right now. Coronavirus dominates the news and social media every day. And these people dealing with grief face constant reminders of the very thing that took a loved one away. Individuals that have lost loved ones to COVID, um, being re-triggered by, you know, counts going up about different states 
choosing different mandates around the coronavirus, not understanding why some people would choose to not wear a mask, for instance, all of it. It's constantly in the news. You can't escape it. I am that person when I'm, you know, at Target and someone's got the mask just below the nose. I'm like, you know, you can still transmit COVID because you don't have your, your nose covered, right? I can't breathe. I lost my dad. I have no shame saying that because people just aren't getting it a year in and they're not getting it. Einstein is a pediatrician. So even in her work, she has to deal with the pandemic. Yes, it's hard uh, because I can't really, really turn it off. Like, you know, I don't, this is what I do for a living. But I'm glad that at that what I do is, you know, is really helping other people. It's definitely, it's worth it, but I won't lie. It's, it makes it tough. Everybody's talking about, well, a year ago, early in the pandemic and how many lives were lost. And it just, it hits me hard every time I hear that. That's, that seems to be my trigger. That seems to be what makes me cry is, a lot of this could have been prevented. Looking at the the count rising every day, I couldn't help but think that my dad is somewhere. I don't know which number he is, but he's somewhere in that count. Finding closure is one of the most difficult things for those who've experienced loss, especially when dealing with other problems posed by the pandemic, like unemployment and their own safety. Many people feel like the next step in healing won't come until the pandemic has passed. So all of these things are impacting everyone at a large macro level, but then it, it's also affecting those that have been affected by both death during COVID as well as death from COVID. The grieving process really won't begin until the pandemic is over. In a weird way, there is the sense that we won't exhale until we know that, you know, there won't be another body count. We can all collectively start to heal as a nation. We absolutely have plans to to have a real in-person memorial for my father when things improve. It may not be for the next year or two, but we'll definitely make it happen. And for many, getting a vaccine is a step in the healing process too. Gillis said she was in tears when she got her first shot. It's a painful day, but a joyous day because my sister got her COVID shot, I got my COVID shot, both have our second appointments booked, and I know that that's all dad would have wanted was to see us safe. Um, I have a necklace that I, I got from the funeral home. They, they took his fingerprint for me, having that, and then like I had they gave me a sticker being like, I got vaccinated for, against COVID. And I took a picture with the two together and I'm like, dad was with me. Uh, so many people are getting their shots with like photos or signs or just some sort of acknowledgement that we're the ones left behind. Every time I see someone get vaccinated, I know we're getting closer to being able to all finally come together and have that memorial mass for her. So that's what really keeps me going lately. I, I think it will be a little bit emotional for me when it's my turn to get the vaccine. I wish she could have made it to this point, but I feel so much better because I don't want anybody to go through what we went through. While the pandemic has isolated us physically over the past year, there are many ways for those who've lost a loved one to find help. Virtual support groups like what Care Dimensions offers is an option, as well as other online support groups on social media. If you're struggling, uh, with with the death, struggling with um, being alone, you know, identity shifts, the the trauma. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to reach out for support within, you know, the therapeutic community. Find find support with your loved ones. Talk about the loved one. Talk about how they're how important they are in your life. Remember them, and integrate them into, into your life and continue those bonds. There's almost like this rallying strength in numbers um, feeling, especially with the COVID group, to just speak up. The experience of grief has changed because of COVID. You don't have to grieve alone. Um, there are just so many 
people like us, like me, other people who are who have lost loved ones and who have um, been able to find support. It's something my counselor says all the time. You have to zoom out from those last weeks. It's not the whole story. Their death was not the whole story and it doesn't define who they were. I keep that in mind on those bad days. And while the pandemic has given us all a feeling of isolation, some choose to use that extra space in a positive way. Life's always a constant go, go, go. And it's really given us a moment to kind of slow down and breathe and to really enjoy the beauty of life.